I'm going to begin with uh, five challenges that I foresee for uh, data-driven machine translation. So let's, um, and I'll tell you just briefly how this arose. We'll go over the five challenges, and then we will uh, discuss how the data-driven machine translation people responded to these in the debate. This is one, this will be one side of the debate, and you'll give the other side. As a matter of fact, I think you're well qualified, some of you, to give, the other, uh, to give an alternative view. The context. In 2006, Lori Gerber, who was then president of AMTA, the Association for Machine Translation in the Americas, invited me and Daniel Marku. So, Marku, M A R C U, to a debate, a participate in a debate, a public debate, as the opening plenary of that year's, of the 2006. Machine Translation Conference in Boston. We interacted, Daniel and I, interacted over a period of several months and prepared a joint set of slides for this debate. I, I have the, the slides uh, with me, but I decided not to use those slides. I'm simply going to extract a few key points and, and then uh, lead into this, this discussion. The question is not, what is the next incremental improvement in data-driven machine translation? Uh, let's first of all define data-driven machine translation. Traditionally, machine translation is what is called rule-driven, based on analysis, transfer, generation. Analysis of the source text, transfer to go from the words of one language to the words of the other language and make syntax syntactic adjustments or incompatibilities between the languages, and then generate the target language text. This is not exactly how data-driven machine translation works. It began as statistical machine translation, where a by text corpus. A corpus is a collection of texts. A by text corpus is a collection of by texts. A by text is a text and its translation segmented and aligned, typically at the sentence level. This is not the only way to build a by text, of course, but typically identify the sentences of a source text, the sentences of the target text, and align them. Say, this sentence was split into two sentences, so it corresponds to these two sentences in this target text. This sentence went straight across to a sentence in the target text. This, these two sentences were combined into one sentence in the target text. A bytext does not work very well when you rearrange the order of the target text in a dramatic way. It is designed for um, translation where there's a general correspondence in the order of information. But that, most translation is that way. It's fairly uncommon to, to, to take a paragraph and put it down somewhere else. Although a bytext could conceivably be designed to accommodate that kind of linkage as well. So, the, um, a corpus of bytexts is the basis for, for data-driven machine translation. Instead of writing rules, handwriting rules, hand-building a lexicon, and handwriting syntactic analysis rules, transfer rules, lexical transfer, syntactic transfer, generation rules, all these rules, 
the vitex corpus is processed and essentially rules are created automatically. So it's not exactly accurate to say that it's not rule driven, but the mean, when people say rule driven versus data driven, they mean rule driven means hand created rules. Data driven means present the data, the bi bilingual data, and ask an algorithm to generate the rules that are used then to translate a text which is presented. And in that case then, pieces of the source text are matched with pieces of other source texts. And during the processing of this bi-text of these, of these documents, things are matched up down to the word level. And there's a tentative dictionary that's developed by the, a bilingual dictionary essentially, that's developed by the data-driven machine translation algorithms that says, well, it looks statistically, it looks like this word is usually translated by this word. But it is, in a sense, context sensitive because there's take, in some data-driven approaches, word, surrounding words are taken into account. Perhaps digrams, two words, perhaps trigrams. Seldom at this point more than trigrams, but there's the potential for going even further away from the word in question. There's an enormous computational cost, but, it, but it's, uh, it's being considered. Although they're taking incremental steps to improve it, there is the, the feeling within the data-driven machine translation community that within the next five years or so, the quality of data-driven machine translation will meet or exceed the quality produced by a prof an experienced professional human translator. This is a very strong claim. And it is not a claim which is ex certainly not accepted by everyone. This was the purpose of this debate, to say, well, going from point A, which is right now, where no one would claim that, that the output of data-driven machine translation of a whole text is indistinguishable from that of a highly uh, trained, experienced, uh, professional human translator. No one would make that claim right now. But if we're going to go from where we are right now to that point, what are some of the obstacles, likely obstacles, that will need to be overcome by the data-driven data machine translation community? Most human translators are not willing to engage in this discussion, this debate, because they emotionally uh, react either uh, with fear or disgust. Fear that it actually might happen and that they will be replaced or disgust that someone would even try to develop a machine that would function the same as a professional human translator. Machine translation already for many years has performed at a level of a beginning uh, language student. That's not the issue. Uh, one of my students even did a, a study and professors of language were unable to detect the difference between SysTran machine translations and, and student translations. Um, that's not the question. The question is going to uh, professional translation. Well, I'm going to, to now, that's the introduction, that's the background. I'm going to present five potential obstacles to, to getting to that level. And then we'll open it for discussion. Okay. Number one. First obstacle, I submit that a translator, a machine translation system, will need to have the same basic skills as a human translator. Skills without which a human translator cannot perform at a professional level. 
So I'll call this human translation skills. And under this, I'll list three. First, you must be able to read and understand the source text. You might say, that's pretty obvious, but wait until we get to the end. Two, you must be able to write in the target language. And third, you must be able to follow a translation brief which uh, we will call um, specifications. In engineering, this should be familiar to those of you with Sorry. an engineering background. What do you call these human skills? Do you mean that all translators fulfill those skills? Because I have doubts if they do. I'm saying that any well-qualified professional human translator can read texts in the source language and understand them. And understand it properly? Yes, otherwise I would not I would not call them or be able to detect that they don't understand and go out and do the research necessary to understand them. Or be able to disqualify themselves because they're not familiar with the subject matter. Be able to write in the target language and be able to follow instructions, say this is this type of translation. Now, although this is um, something toward the end, if a professional human translator does not have these three skills and they're not interested in acquiring them, they might consider a different line of work. Okay, number two. Um, the uh, data-driven machine translation developers will need to avoid the compositionality assumption. Assumption is, compositionality assumption, is that the meaning of a text is created by or computed as in interpretive semantics, if you're familiar with linguistic theory, is computed by starting from the bottom with the words of a sentence, combining the words according to their syntactic relations, combining the meanings of the words, and until you get the meaning of a sentence or meanings of a sentence, and combining the meanings of the sentences to get the meaning of a document. But it's this bottom-up combining piece by piece. I submit for discussion later, that this is usually the case in human language text, source text, but not always. There are exceptions to uh, the meaning being strictly compositional. Third, the data-driven machine translation system must be able to use relevant textual information beyond the sentence. There are many instances when a proper translation cannot be made looking just at a sentence in isolation. You actually need to use information outside of the current, the words of the current sentence. So any approach to data-driven machine translation that works on a sentence-by-sentence -sentence level, which is the way rule-driven machine translation systems have worked from the beginning, is doomed to failure if they want to achieve top-notch human, uh, professional human translator capabilities. Fourth, I suggest, pardon me, uh, yes, there we go, use relevant non-textual -te information. Real world knowledge about the current situation, about politics, about, about culture, about history, facts in the real world of many, many kinds. Um, that, that is not 
encoded explicitly in text. It may be, may be in image, it may be in sound, it may be in temperature, it may be in cultural knowledge that's not explicitly textual. And I realize that's controversial because some people believe that everything is encoded in text. And fifth,